<laughs> I'm, we're here to interview David Hibbett. And David is a, a longtime uh, student of mycology, as far as we're concerned. And one of my big regrets was that uh, I thought maybe David would come to Baton Rouge on a postdoc. But instead, he stayed at Harvard, which was a really good decision for him. And so we want to ask David some things like, where was he born? What was his family life like? How did he get influenced to go into mycology and where he went to school and all? So Dave, where were you born? Okay, um, I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts and um, grew up in Arlington. Uh, my father was a faculty member at Harvard, so he was a colleague of Don's, um, which turned out to be a very important uh, factor in my life later. Um, I went to public school in Arlington. I also spent a, a couple of childhood years in Japan. I went to first grade in Japan. Um, then I went to UMass Amherst, where I was not a particularly good student. It took me five years to finish up, including two summers at the U of Michigan Field Station. Then I took a year off and went to Duke, where I was Rita Svilgelis' first PhD student. Okay, so you took a year off after after your, your time at Massachusetts? Yeah, I took a year off and I worked as a um, technician for the Army Corps of Engineers doing okay. water quality monitoring, counting um, phytoplankton samples in polluted rivers all over New England. Huh. You know, students always ask me, I don't want to stra go straight to graduate school, is that bad? Do you think it was good for you to work for a year? Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. It was one of the greatest years of my life because I was out of school so I didn't have those obligations, and I felt like I had a lot of money. I didn't, but I felt like I did. Um, and then after I was accepted to Duke, I felt like I had everything all set. I, my, my future was certain. Um, I was very relaxed. I was completely unrealistic about what, <laughs> what graduate school was going to be like or what my career trajectory was going to be like, but it was, it was a magnificent year. Good. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your father, and I will just I insert the little piece that as a young assistant professor at Harvard, I was assigned by somebody, department or otherwise, to the FAS, Faculty of Arts and Science Library Committee. And I showed up at the meeting, and we were introducing ourselves, and I introduced myself as a mycologist. And this man next to me turned and said, you know, my son is a graduate student studying fungi. And that was your father, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah, so that, that was my <laughs> introduction, both to you. You know, I didn't know you at that point, but and mm -hmm. to your father. Well, it makes sense that you would have been on a committee together because you and he are uh, bibliophiles. <laughs> no, as but am I, I, I suppose. <laughs> you are now. Yeah, yeah you yeah. are. Yeah. So you went to Duke? I went to Duke. Um, not to study fungi, actually. I had taken, I was a botany major at UMass. I took all of the sort of traditional ologies, botanical mm -hmm. ologies I possibly could. And as I said, I spent two years at the U of Michigan Field Station. Had you had the Bigelow's course at Bar and Yeah, Bigelow? so I, I had Howard Bigelow um, taught a sort of a one credit Mushrooms of New England course, which mm -hmm. I took, and it was fun, and I thought mushrooms were cool, and mm -hmm. I liked I liked Howard and Margaret Bigelow, but I had by no means decided to be a mycologist. Um, I also took Bob Fogel's uh, Ecology of Forest Fungi course at Michigan. At, in Michigan, which was really um, Ecology of Ectomycorrhizal Fungi. And I liked that also, but what I really liked was um, courses on bryology from Howard Crum, who was one of the distinguished American bryologists. So I, I chose Duke um, because Duke had a very broad program in botany, including bryology. Um, Lewis Anderson and Brent Mishler were there at the time, and they also had phycology, which I liked, and obviously plant things. Um, but I, so I headed off to Duke intending to study plant systematics. And Ritas and I actually probably arrived in Durham within a couple of weeks of each other, because he was just starting that year. <laughs> um, and I knew I wanted to do molecular systematics, uh, and Redis had the only molecular evolution lab in the botany department at the time, which is, that was 1986. And Redis uh, 
was incredibly generous with his laboratory resources and his, and his um, knowledge, and he opened the door and he let me come in and try to work on uh, plants. There was uh, my office mate who was also working on plants was in Redis's lab. Uh, there was a woman working on lemurs, Ann Yoder, very, very successful uh, you know, zoologist. I, I knew her at Hope College. She was a student at Hope College yeah, when I taught there. She's a star. And, yeah. uh, and also um, the person who would become my wife, who was studying uh, red algae, Mar my wife Margaret Carroll. Was, we were all in Redis's lab working on things other than fungi. <laughs> I was trying to study pitcher plants and I, because I thought they were cool, which they are. And I drove all over the coastal plain trying to collect pitcher plants and filled our freezers with them. And those were in the days before PCR, so I was trying to get high quality DNA and RNA out of the pitchers, which proved impossible. Um, and about a year into this, I just gave up on the Saracenia project. I was very depressed. Everything was just you know, going to pieces. But I'd always been into fungi, so I thought, well, I need a new project. Uh, I'm in this mycology lab. Mushrooms are cool. Um, I'll just switch to fungi, and that's what I did. I just stumbled into mycology um, by virtue of failing at being a botanist. Um, and then a little soon thereafter, we got PCR in the lab. And if PCR had been available when I started grad school, the Saracenia project would have worked. Mm -hmm. um, and I might be a plant systematist now, but I, I, consider, I consider myself immensely fortunate to be a mycologist because I, I feel like uh, it's, well, first of all, it's just a really fun field to be in with wonderful people and great biology and great problems. But it's also a small enough discipline that, you know, I feel like I was actually able to do something useful, whereas, you know, plant, plant biology is a much bigger field. Well, so small in number, out. small in number of people who study fungi, but big in numbers of fungi that aren't studied. Yeah, right, huge in, huge in scope and in importance, but, but underpopulated mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, researchers. So what did you do for your PhD when you decided? Um, right, so I picked a genus uh, Lentinus, which turned out to be um, a good, lucky choice. I was reading some of the works of the, some of the, the great mycologists, so Rolf Singer, uh, David Pegler, uh, Corner, and they all seem to be incapable of agreeing on the generic limits of Lentinus or Lentinus and Penis. And then Scott Redhead and Jim Ginz had looked at these, uh, the decay chemistry of these things, and they split out new genera. It seemed like a classic taxonomic conundrum. Um, so I decided that I would try to work on Lentinus. Um, both just to do sort of straight ahead systematics, understand the generic limits, but also there were these anatomical hints that suggested that Lentinus, which has gills, of course, um, was related to polypores. So at the time, uh, gills versus pores was a huge big deal in fungal taxonomy. And so the idea that you could have closely related things with gills and pores really cried out for some, some work. Um, the shiitake genus Lentinula had also been pulled out of Lentinus, so that made it interesting. Um, and it worked out really nicely. It turned out that what, what Pegler had called Lentinus was split across not just multiple genera, but multiple orders. So it was, uh, it was an early demonstration of the power of molecular techniques to uh, resolve relationships in uh, what we now call agaricomycetes. And again, that was just, it was good luck. I mean, well, it was good luck, but also um, I had to do a lot of reading to find, to find the problem. Sure. Um, but it was a, it was a good choice. And then you finished up there, and did you go to Japan then? Yeah. So I um, so my project, um, you know, the amount of molecular data that I collected in my PhD, uh, you know, you w you wouldn't even get a single poster at an MSA meeting with that amount of data. Now it was such a small contribution, but it took me nonetheless, it took me, you know, three and a half years. Well, it was a good start and it yeah. answered a question. Right, but my point is that, you know, I, I did my PhD in five years. A year of that was spent um, on this failed Saracenia project. So, you know, three and a half, four years of work um, on molecular systematics of Lentinus. It was really hard to get molecular data back then. You know, we were running uh, 
acrylamide gels to do DNA sequencing and reading the reading the autoradiograms by hand and all that stuff. So we you know we had it tough. Um, and so I'd put all of this energy into molecular systematics, but by the end of my PhD, I felt like I really didn't know that much about fungi. You know, I didn't really know that much about morphology. Um, I, you know, I've always wanted to be the kind of mycologist that can go out in the woods and, you know, know lots of mushrooms. And, I, and I'm still not, and I certainly wasn't then. So I decided I wanted to do a project that was focused on morphology. And in particular, I wanted to focus on development because I thought, you know, morphological evolution is developmental evolution. So I did, I did a morphological Evo Devo project in Japan at the Totori Mycological mm -hmm. Institute. I had, um, I had gotten a grant as a graduate student to study Japanese. The NSF for a while had a program to encourage American scientists and engineers to study Japanese. Um, incredibly visionary program. So. I followed up that with a grant from the Japan Society for Promotion of Science to go for a foreign postdoc to Totori, where I worked with Aki Tsuneda, who is a, a great um, electron microscopist. And Totori is supported by the, the shiitake industry, so they really know how to grow mushrooms in culture. And I wanted to grow the things that had been, well, lentinus and things formerly classified in lentinus in culture to look at ontogeny of the gills because the molecular work had suggested that those gills were products of conversion evolution. I wanted to look at development to see if that corroborated it and to see if I could learn something about the pore gill switch. So we also looked at the development of the poroid relatives of lentinus. Um, so I completely switched from molecular systematics to developmental morphology. Um, and I'm really glad I did because I thought the work that came out of it was, at least to me, it was informative. Um, I learned a lot about well, morphology and fungal development. But molecular systematics was just going through the roof at that point. So from a, strictly from a career perspective, it might have been smarter for me to have carried on with molecular systematics because I kind of got in on the ground floor um, on that. But instead, I took this giant veering detour, um, uh, both in terms of the discipline and geographically. You know, I moved to Japan for a year, um, and it was a wonderful experience. Margaret and I went and lived in Japan, and it was just, you know, so fantastic to be there. And, and in this, I, I am my mother is Japanese American, so that was mm -hmm. also important for me. Um, you didn't have any relatives then? Oh, I do. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah, I did, and I did and still do oh. in Japan and in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was a hard shift, you know. I was picking up a new discipline, uh, kind of a weird area, you know, fungal, fungal development is, you know, it's a little esoteric. Um, and I moved to Japan for a year, and I, I had a very hard time finding a job because it was pre-internet. Um, every now and then people would fax us, I mean, they would fax us copies of job ads from the back of pages of science and I would apply and, and get, get no response. I actually did get one interview while I was in Japan, but the job didn't pan out. So Margaret, my wife, um, got a job in Massachusetts at Framingham State College, now Framingham State University. So she preceded me back to Massachusetts where she had a job. And since I had no job to hurry back to, I decided to go to New Guinea um, on my way back to, Mass to <coughs> North America. And I went and I had a great time and collected some material that ended up actually being useful in research. Um, and then I landed in a heap back in Massachusetts. I followed my wife back to Massachusetts where I had no job and she had a job. And the, career, the job search had been a disaster to that point. I was very depressed. and. Um, <coughs> And I'm very glad you're uh, involved in this interview because Don played uh, a really critical role in my, uh, in my career at that mo moment because you offered me uh, a position as associate of the Harvard Herbaria and you gave me um, uh, an office in the Farlow and, uh, you know, and some excellent letterhead from which to write <laughs> letters of application. True. And I, <laughs> I sat in the Farlow for for part of that winter of 92, 93, and wrote papers and tried to regroup and get my act together. I taught a microbiology course for nurses at Framingham State. And then at that time, 
um, you know, Michael Donahue was coming to Harvard, and I, I remember writing to him and saying, you know, dear Dr. Donahue, and I'd, I'd met him at a Willie Hennig Society meeting, so I, I had met him, but I wrote to him and basically just asked him to hire me, and uh, miraculously he did, um, and and that start, and then I had this fantastic postdoc, but um, but you played a key role, and I, I am forever grateful for to you for for making that possible. Well. I'm glad it all worked out. But yeah. then you worked for Michael and you had to set up that <coughs> whole lab, right? Yeah, well I think Michael hired me because I had experience in molecular systematics mm -hmm. and so, um, and I got the feeling that Harvard had moved heaven and earth to bring Michael and resources were not a problem, the lab was incredible and, uh, and I spent six and a half years in HUH as a postdoc um, in Michael's lab um, and Michael Donahue, of course, is an angiosperm systematist. You know, I've always felt a great affinity for plants, um, and so working in the Donahue lab was was wonderful. Well, and Michael had an affinity for fungi too. He he liked to think about fungi. He but. did. He was a he sort of became a patron of mycology. He um, his brother is a shiitake grower, um, and Michael ended up actually giving us the Carling lecture when we met. Uh, so uh, that's one right. year. That's right. Uh, so it all it all worked out very yeah. nicely. But then, and his brother actually acted. He worked for Michael Ogier. Oh yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Anyway, so it took me a Thank long time, did. but I, I finally got a job, a faculty position at Clark University in Worcester. Um, along the way, my wife and I came to the conclusion that we were going to stay in Massachusetts for the long haul, and so I stopped looking at opportunities outside of Southern New England. Um, which, you know, again, from a, you know, from a st strictly careerist perspective, you know, that 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 limited uh, my options. But but my family is from Massachusetts. Margaret's family is Massachu from Massachusetts. She has um, a very good job at Framingham State. Um, my children got to grow up knowing their grandparents, so it it all worked out. But certainly not a straight line, and 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 a lot of a lot of anxiety along the way. So you became department chairman at some point? Uh, just interim for one mm -hmm. year, yeah. Oh, was, okay, I thought yeah. it was longer than that. Nope, just one year. Mm -hmm. And then <coughs> then you went, uh, you got a Radcliffe Fellowship? Yeah, um, the year before last, I was a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute, which was um, um, absolutely wonderful. Um, the, the year went by very fast, but it was great to be able to spend time interacting with, uh, well, there were some scientists there, including some evolutionary biologists. Um, Axel Meyer and Jiheng Yang were there, so that was, and I knew those guys in advance. But, you know, mainly people from the humanities, social sciences, independent artists and journalists, so it was a, it was a great year. Um, I worked on my, my current major project, which is a book on fungal systematics for a um, a general audience or an, an educated lay audience, which is still nowhere near uh, complete. But, but I think it'd be good for students, too. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a lot yeah. of students. Well, Meredith was also a Radcliffe Fellow. Yep. <laughs> we, we had this all planned with Meredith, that she was going to come and we were going to do things and everything was going to be wonderful. And then I was asked to be interim dean of Harvard College. So Meredith spent the the year with me as interim dean, and we often missing from the table missing, at lunch. Me missing, yeah. But anyway. we had a good time. But it was. Mm. In I mean, we both all did. Yeah. yeah. In no, your that's time a very there, good experience. it was great. Yeah. Yeah. So, anything else you want to tell anybody that will watch this video? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't feel like we've really talked about science all that much. No, and, um, and you know, that would be a good thing to do because some of the <laughs> things that you've done recently are really interesting. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I, I think my work has been um, integrative, um, and I've always done what I've, you know, I've always been very spoiled. I, I, I've done exactly what I want to do. So I wanted to do molecular systematics. I wanted to do development. Um, and I've been able to focus on the things that, that interest me. I've done a little paleomycology, and, um, and I think molecular phylogenetics is probably what I'm 
you know, that's the majority of my work is probably what I'm best known for. But I've also, you know, I've, I've really benefited from the advent of, of uh, genomics. Mm -hmm. and, and I've had wonderful collaborators. You know, one of the great things about, um, you know, the genomic revolution is that it's brought people together that, that previously wouldn't have uh, necessarily collaborated because the data are, are so accessible now, including such as the, uh, the person you interviewed just a few minutes ago, Joe Heitman. Have you been <laughs> able sitting to collaborate? Right over there. Um, but you know, nowadays I, you know, I do an awful lot of work with people who not that long ago might not have been all that interested in working with systematists, mm -hmm. uh, you know, informaticians mm -hmm. and what hardcore molecular what about geneticists. The decay? What about decay? I think decay is really interesting. So tell yeah. us about what you Well, know. okay, so I mentioned way back in our conversation that uh, Redhead and Ginz had split up Lentinus mm -hmm. based on decay chemistry. So the brown rot genera, were, or the brown rot species were put in a couple of segregate genera and the white rot things were, were left aside. And I had studied that uh, from a molecular phylogenetics perspective, mapping on shifts in decay chemistry onto the tree, usually, you know, the methods that you, that you use, you know, trees based on ribosomal sequences and then you just mapped the characters on. So naturally, when uh, genomics became available, one of the things that I wanted to study was uh, the evolution of white rot and brown rot, but not just not just making tick marks on cladograms, not just mapping it on, but trying to understand the actual genetic bases of um, of those changes. And that turned out to be an incredibly gratifying um, uh, area to work in because we could really see uh, dramatic shifts in gene content associated with shifts between from white rot to brown rot. Um, and that's an area I continue to work in now, although now it's not just looking at patterns of transitions between white rot and brown rot, but looking at uh, more sort of downstream questions like the evolution of substrate specificity um, and currently uh, collaboration with Jonathan Schilling here at University of Minnesota looking at evolution of brown rot uh, in terms of shifts in regulation, spatial, spatial um, uh, spatial gene uh, elements of, of gene regulation in decay fungi. So, um, yeah, so that continues. Yeah. That's been, so decay has been great. Uh, morphology continues to be um, probably, you know, one of my favorite subjects and uh, major focus right now is sort of evo devo, so evolutionary developmental genetics, again, using genomic and transcriptomic methods. And I, I figure that's one, gonna be one of the major areas I work on for a while. You gave a wonderful public lecture for the M Museum of Natural History. And uh, I remember part of this because you were taking on the uh, observation about the development of the uh, genes for uh, rot in the Carboniferous. Right. And you made the point at that lecture that people misinterpreted or misconstrued uh, that data for the headlines. Yes. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, um, so uh, the most high profile paper we had on this subject, um, which was published in Science in 2012, noted that the evolution of white rot, so the, which involves the, um, not just the ability to decay lignin, but that's a key part of it, but also expansion of of uh, enzymes that attack crystalline cellulose and other, other cell wall components. So the elaboration of that white rot mechanism roughly coincided with the decline in um, coal formation at the end of the Carboniferous with you know, very broad intervals on the, on the time estimates. So we tried to be rather nuanced in our presentation of those results, but we, you know, we pointed out that the evolution of white rot may have coincided with this decline in coal, uh, d decline in coal deposition at the end of the Carboniferous. And that got out into the blogosphere, and so we started seeing some really silly headlines like um, uh, coal killing fungus could boost biofuels, and um, uh, mushroom culprit for coal shortage. I mean, these were actual headlines. So. Um, yeah, they completely, completely missed it. And then there was some one article in particular that was that questioned our findings that I think also um, 
didn't pick up on some of the nuance of what we were putting out. Um, anyway, all of this helped convince me that it's really important for us scientists to be able to speak um, not only to each other but to the general public and to really engage with the media uh, because if we don't put energy into telling our stories, um, the members of the media, even people who are trying very hard, um, will get things wrong. Um, so that's, I think, part of the reason why I'm write, trying to write this book now because I'm, and why I put a fair amount of energy into, into speaking to uh, general audiences um, such as that that group at the yeah. Harvard Museum no, of Natural it was, History. It was so successful. You know, they came to me after and they said, oh, we filled the hall and it was being live broadcast and it was yeah. the biggest number that they'd ever had. And, it, and, it's because, and it's because the word mushrooms was in the title. Oh. It had nothing to do with me. It's mushrooms. Well, maybe. Um, well, we and don't I give mean, yourself credit. No, no, that's just a, that's, that's, no, it's a statement of fact. I mean, pe there's, mushrooms are having this big cultural moment right now. They are. And I guarantee that, I mean, I think we broke some kind of attendance record or something. And I, I guarantee that the overwhelming majority of people in the room had never heard of me, but they were interested in mushrooms. And, and mushrooms are having this cultural moment, and it may not go on forever, right? Um, so our community has this opportunity right now to you know, ride this wave and, and try to support the amateur community and educate them. Um, because you know, who knows, 10 years from now, um, the mushroom moment may be, may could be, be over. Could be diatoms. I doubt it, but <laughs> maybe seaweeds. Or <laughs> I doubt that, too. <laughs> Any other part of your work? We've missed lots of it. Um, the mycorrhizal. Yeah, you know, I, so morpho transition. morphology, um, ecology, but the other thing is just um, classification, taxonomy. It's all about uh, communicating our understanding of diversity in the tree of life. So. Um, that's something that matters to me a great deal. I really want, and this really is mainly for other scientists, but it's for all of humanity because all of humanity is a consumer of taxonomy. Um, I've, I've been very interested in trying to promote understanding of diversity through taxonomy. And also, I've been interested in just thinking about how we do taxonomy. I really feel like it, you know, we're creating a language. You know, we're building the language of biodiversity Language is something that only works well when everybody understands what it means the same way. Um, so I feel like taxonomy is something that, at least, you know, big picture taxonomy really needs to be done at a community level. It, it's a communal enterprise because we're not just creating something for ourselves, we're creating language that everybody has to use. Um, and in fact, so the, the interview just prior to this one, Joe Heitman, which you should, which everybody should go and watch that one. Um, uh, was speaking about the importance of taxonomy in the community that studies Cryptococcus, a very important uh, human pathogen. And there have been some real controversies there about what names to use. So taxonomy really, really matters. And that's something I've thought about a lot. We, in 2007, we published a large classification paper on a higher level phylogenetic classification for the fungi which is still my most highly cited paper and probably the most important paper I will ever write. Um, and that was, um, that was a, you know, 70 authors or something trying to come up with a consensus community classification. I'm, I'm very mm -hmm. proud of that, that work and, you know, really gratified that so many taxonomists were willing to participate in that. Well, and, and follow and use it and follow and, it. And there were about probably people from 40 countries, I think, somewhere yeah, and around there. Yeah, and at the time we had this crazy situation where we all agreed on what the major groups were, mm -hmm. but different groups of people who had had, you know, different major professors were using different names for the same group. So everybody mm -hmm. agreed on what the groups were, but they disagreed on what names used, which is silly. Um, and so that Community-driven taxonomy is something I've been interested in, and also other things like automated taxonomy, phylogenetic taxonomy, se uh, sequence-based names. These are all things that matter to me because I think that they uh, can have a big impact on, on understanding of biodiversity and our ability to communicate with each, with each other. So that's been another area that's been very important to me. Great. 
Well, thanks very much. We Thank enjoyed you. talking to you. Thank you, David. You. Yep, my and pleasure. We'll let you know when the YouTube's up. Yeah.